Welcome to this episode of What's Happening Wapaka. I am Joni. Today we're going to talk about finances. We're going to talk about what they are. We're going to talk about how we get into a place where we're living paycheck to paycheck or worse. And we're going to talk about some simple ideas that we can do that are going to help us get to the other side and get to the point where we have a little bit of money in savings. We have a couple of great guests on that work with finances from a couple of different areas. We have Kate Moody. Welcome to the show. Thank you. She is with Ms. Moody, <laughs> and she is a personal financial coach and consultant. Tell us a little bit about what you do, Kate. So I work with individuals one-on-one. -on -one. I specialize with uh, women who are recently divorced or widowed and are trying to navigate the challenging waters of money management for the first time. So it's education, it's guidance, support, coaching, accountability. It takes a few months, um, but get people on that path. Uh, and then on the other hand, I work with businesses to create financial wellness programs tailored to whatever their needs are. Oh, great. Good to have you on the program Thank today. You. We also have Jay Kirchner. We get to see you again, Jay. Always good to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. You are with Farmer State Bank and you are here now coming from the attitude of a vice president of a bank. Do you see a whole lot with finances as far as the job you do in the bank? Yeah, we still get questions at the bank of, what do you mean I don't have enough money at the bank? I, I have checks in my checkbook and various comments like that. So, you know, we're always trying to educate the public on, on different ways to monitor your finances and, and improve your financial situation. And that's a good thing. I mean, to have a bank that really wants to educate, to help their consumers get a step ahead is always a good thing instead of being a little bit more worried about just the money aspect. Mm -hmm. So we're going to start today and we're going to talk, we're going to start with segment one talking about what a financial problem looks like. Because I'll tell you from my point of view for many, many years, financial problems meant that I didn't have any money for groceries. Or if I had a flat tire, I didn't have enough money to buy a new tire or fix the one that I have. Or I was 30 days late on the electric bill. So is that what it looks like or, or is the definition of financial problems wider than that, Jay? Well, we, we see all aspects of it. We see people that when you look at how much they're earning on a uh, weekly, monthly basis, they shouldn't be in financial situations and they are. Um, but we see a lot of people working paycheck to paycheck and, and some of it uh, comes from when you drive by the great chain of lakes you wish you could be on that or you wish you could have a boat or wish you could have some of these things that you see everyone else having. So we see a lot of people, not just people that are, are maybe not making as much money, we see it through all aspects of, of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's a great point that you can have a lot of money or a large income, but still be living paycheck to paycheck. So is it paycheck to paycheck that makes somebody broke? I, I mean, it's, you know, we all have, there are all problems, we are all in situations in our life, I think, where money is very tight. And you start to have to say, what do I need to give up or what do I need to do differently? Mm -hmm. But is it really about paycheck to paycheck or is there more to the definition of financial problems or living in a constant state of financial stress, which I think is a better way of talking about it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it is a matter of financial stress and there's certain cues like if you're paying late fees or overdraft fees or maybe you have a retirement fund and you have to dip into it in order to pay regular bills. That's a problem because you should never dip into your retirement fund until you actually retire. Um, sometimes maybe if you have to take out a payday loan, that's a huge cue that you're not setting aside enough. Everybody should have an emergency fund. If you don't have an emergency fund or savings, that's a big cue that you are financially stressed because you know in the back of your head something's going to happen. You're going to need the winter tires because we live in Wisconsin. Um, or you know, somebody's going to get sick, you're going to have to pay a doctor's bill. 
at some point you're going to have to owe a few hundred to a few thousand dollars. And usually it's that situation that puts people into a debt spiral that they can't get out of, in my experience and a lot of the research shows. Now, Kate, I know that you came with a bunch of statistics. <laughs> yes. um, for And you found some specifically for Wapaka County. Mm -hmm. So share a couple of those with us. Uh, yeah. So I'll start with um, what a living wage is in Wapaka County. And this is from MIT's living wage calculator. So if you're just one adult to live here, you should be making $10, $11 an hour. And that's $23,000 a year, which is uh, pretty low. As soon as you throw a child into the mix, one adult, one child, suddenly that person has to be making $23 an hour and almost 50 grand a year. Uh, when you put it into those terms, suddenly people feel like, oh my god, I am not making enough money. <coughs> I'm not having kids. Yeah, <laughs> yes, kids are very expensive. Yeah. Yeah, well, there's $13 an hour. <laughs> On a 40, yeah. right? Yes. I mean, if you put that into a financial perspective that we get, they're $13 an hour on a 40-hour week. Now, most of us love our children enough to do whatever it is that we need to do mm -hmm. to take care of them. But I think that that puts the expense of kids into a very real thing that we can think about when we go to work and say, I don't make $23 an hour. Yeah. Yeah, if you have two adults, it suddenly becomes more reasonable, but both of them would have to be making about $13 an hour so that you have $52,000 a year. And that's two adults and one child. And there's a lot more than one child households, or more children than that in many households in the area. Uh, some other interesting statistics I found was that although about 11% of people in WAPAC are technically poverty level, Another 25% of people are really uh, income constrained and they struggle to make just their basic necessities every month. Making more than one in three person here have real financial struggle. And I, and I know that there are, they, they step from being, um, you know, 80% of poverty to 100% to 125 to 200% poverty. Even 200% poverty is considered a low to moderate income person. Mm -hmm. And I saw some statistics not very long ago that talked about, and I, and I won't guarantee you that they're correct, but we took a look at them, and it was something like 70% of Wapaka County was living somewhere in the spectrum of low to moderate income. And a lot of those people are outside of Wapaka. Mm -hmm. You know, they're out in the, in the smaller towns in the country, but still, that's a huge number. Is that kind of what you see at the bank? Yeah, I, th I think there's a, th those statistics are alarming. And obviously, you know, you hear about free reduced lunch, there's people on that. They're, you know, but when you think about it, a lot of people get comfortable with what they're living on, and then you add a kid, and then you, you have to give things up. And I think human nature is hard to give things up that you've been used to having. And I think that's where we get, all of us get ourselves in trouble is we, we, we want some things and, and we're used to having those. And, and when you have kids and you have certain situations or you have a, a spouse that loses a job, you have to sacrifice some things. And that's the hardest thing I think people have and is giving some of that up to, to stay. That, and I don't know if enough people understand budgeting. They don't understand what their expenses are. Mm -hmm. That's the biggest thing we see is they know they spend money, but we ask them, what'd you spend money on in the last couple of months? And they won't be able to write it down. Where the, the, the people that are budget conscious could actually just rattle it off right as we're sitting here. Those that aren't, if we had to say that, write it down as you spend it, they would be surprised when they go through that, that month what they're doing. And what we typically see is we see a lot of people with a having savings account, like you suggested, but all they do is put money in and then a week later they're transferring it out and transferring it in and transferring it out and they're never getting ahead with that. So, you know, our recommendation with that is just be patient with it. See what your budget is, see what you have, mm -hmm. and, and don't be so quick to think you have to do some of those until you have extra money that's there every month. 
yep. every, every month down the road. So. And we're going to talk about this more because part of what I used to teach in budgeting classes had to do with savings accounts, so I want to make sure we come back to that. So we're going to talk about that a little bit more, but we're going to come back in the next segment and we're going to talk about a little bit more about why financial stress happens to people because I think that our perception of why it happens is way too narrow and we need to widen that and we need to open it a little bit more because we talked a, a little bit before the show about how important the communication is. Not only about talking to your kids about budgeting because it's a good thing to learn. They don't want to learn it when you teach it, but it'll do them good. In schools, you know, Jay is teaching some classes at the schools, but communicating with each other about it so that it doesn't become such a huge stigma. So we're going to talk about that in just a few minutes when we come back. This is Joni and you're watching What's Happening Wapaka. Are you ready? If an emergency happens, are you prepared to take care of yourself? Are you ready to take care of your animals and not just for a day? Are you ready to be on your own for two days, for three days? I'll be ready. Will you? Get ready. Visit www.doonething.us to learn what you should do now. Welcome back to this episode of What's Happening Wapaka. We're talking money today, and we're talking money with Kate Moody and Jay Kirchner, who are here helping us understand a little bit of finances. We talked in the first segment about what is financial stress? A lot of us call it poverty, but that's not necessarily true, as we talked about. Um, so I think financial stress is a b much better way to think about it. So we're going to talk about why it happens to us. Because I th we were talking before the show, mm -hmm. um, Kate and Jay and I, and we were talking about how financial stress can happen to anyone. So when you're broke, when you're living paycheck to paycheck and you're making minimum wage at seven and a quarter or whatever it is an hour and you can barely pay rent, much less buy food, it is very understandable. But when you have a college degree and you're an engineer and you're making $150,000 a year, suddenly it's really hard to understand how we can be financially stressed. Mm -hmm. And I've talked to people who said they had neighbors that had brand new houses, but they were house poor. They couldn't afford curtains on the inside of them. And you mentioned the Chain of Lakes, Jay, and how people want that huge house on the Chain of Lakes. Do they think about the taxes they're going to have to pay every year on that once they buy it? Not typically. <laughs> not, not, not until you have to, after you, or, or you get the bill. And, the, and that's, the, that's the part. That's the sh sticker shock once you get it. So. Yep. And my husband and I used to have those conversations because we bought our dream house out in the country. And I started sitting down because I tell you, I am a master budgeter. And we started, I sat down and I started doing the numbers. Well, it's going to cost us this. This is a few mileage our vehicles get. So this is how much more it's going to cost us to drive to Appleton and go to work. This is how much more we're going to have to pay for insurance and for taxes and for all of this kind of stuff. This is how much we're going to save because there is no order in pizza out where I, <laughs> you know what I mean? I ran down the whole list and he thought it was crazy to do that. But it's, I mean, it's true. Those are the kinds of things you have to think about when you're doing that, right? Oh my God. Yeah. That's what, if everybody did that, I think America would be in a far better financial situation or Americans, I should say just actually writing it down. You had mentioned budgeting uh, before, and that's pretty much always the first thing when you're working with somebody that you tell them to do is just write, write down where your money, meant, money went. And everyone is surprised. They say, I cannot believe I spent X amount on this. Um, but there's a lot of different reasons why somebody making $150,000 could suddenly be broke. <laughs> Uh, I think very often what it is is that they feel like they should uh, show the world how much money they make um, because for whatever reason, so they buy too much house. 
and they buy the expensive car, and they buy the nice clothes. And sometimes it can be for professional reasons. If I was going to go to a lawyer, and I've got the choice between somebody driving a 10-year-old Honda in kind of a crummy suit and somebody driving a new Mercedes looking very fancy, I'd probably hire the person with the Mercedes. So there's professional reasons why people might end up spending that much money. At the end of the day, however, the person driving that Civic is going to be far more wealthy than the person driving the Mercedes. And isn't this about, and I have to imagine you see this at the bank a lot, where people come in for a small personal loan because the transmission went to their car, or because the, somebody broke their leg and they have $2,000 in doctor bills. I mean, we talk about my horses. My horses are cheap <laughs> compared to humans. Um, but still, for me to have a vet bill of 250 or three or $400 is nothing. And it's, it's, it's about, they have plenty of money coming in Everything is going out, but they don't have an emergency fund mm -hmm. set aside. And I, is, that, is that one of the reasons why people find themselves in what you call the downward spiral yes. of finances is because, you know, we all know something's going to break, right? Yep. I mean, something in your house is going to break, right? Jay, your right. car or your furnace or your air conditioner or something, mm -hmm. why don't we think about that? Well, I think it's based on credit cards. I mean, the rainy day fund is a credit card, but they don't re realize that you got to pay 18 to 25 percent back on that. You used to have a savings account. I only spent the money if I had it in my savings account to, to back that up. Now it's, well, I have this, this credit card, I'll just spend mm -hmm. it. And, and a lot of people that get themselves in debt don't realize it until that bill comes or don't realize it until that. Uh, there's credit online. You can get credit online and you don't read the fine print because you don't have anyone explaining it because you're on the internet doing it. And you can get $2,500 for those expenses you're talking about, but you're paying 25 to 30 percent. Or 40? Or 40. And, and now mm -hmm. all of a sudden you were in debt before and how do you get out trying to pay that kind of interest when doing some other things or eliminating some things could help eliminate some of those, those debt. But I, I see people living paycheck to paycheck thinking the credit card is the rainy day fund and thinking, um, you know, these online loans are the answer or um, pay loan and, and those types of situations, those interest rates are so high you're actually digging yourself further into, into financial um, risk and financial situations. Mm -hmm. We've talked about this for Christmas gifts, people charge Christmas. All the time. And then they spend the entire next year paying off Christmas <laughs> plus all the interest so they yeah. can charge Christmas again. And I found out, I gotta ask you guys if you know this, there is a recommended amount, a percentage of your income you should spend on Christmas gifts. Do you guys know what that is? I do not. Not no. Christmas specifically, usually set aside about 5% just for gifts in general, but. One half of 1% of the annual household income is what they suggest on spending for Christmas. So $50,000 income, the, um, the recommended amount that you spend on Christmas for your entire family is $250. Does that blow your mind? That's incredible, actually. I thought that was wild. And I don't spend anywhere near that because I have a tendency, because John and I were on such a tight budget, we had no money for Christmas or birthday or birthday parties. And so I would flea market for, um, I would flea market for Christmas gifts that they couldn't find in a store anyway, so they never knew how much I spent. And I would get these wonderful, unique things that were perfect for them for like two bucks. And it meant the world. And so we have, but that's, I mean, now I'm getting into segment three, which <laughs> is how do, we, how do we make our lives a little bit better? But I think that's part of it. I mean, whether we're talking about the boat or the house on the mm -hmm. chain, or whether we're talking about a new car, or whether we're talking about a holiday, we tend to spend more mm -hmm. than we make because, well, I have next week's paycheck. 
you know, I'll have more money. I'm going to get a raise. I'm going to get a promotion one of these days and we'll be able to, right? Do you find that? Yeah, people spend money before they earn it all the time, you know, because they already have the next five things on their list that they're looking for or looking to do, and, and they're just waiting for the money to come in to do those things. So. And how much is society, TV shows where, you know, two broke girls are, are living with their furniture matches. I mean, have you ever <laughs> noticed that? Broke people on TV, all of their furniture matches. I don't know about you guys, none of my furniture ever matched. <laughs> and I went dumpster hunting for it because mm -hmm. <laughs> free was great. But, you know, society says you need a new car or society says you need new furniture. And we're going to do this for you. And it's five years interest um five years with no interest on your loan if you paid off so how much does that have to do with all of the problems that we're having i think naturally about 25 percent of the population um, sees money as a status symbol but then when you have so much marketing going i've I think I've heard that we see something like 3,000 ads a day. Mm -hmm. When you have that much marketing going on, people trying to sell you things, trying to sell you things, then suddenly we just want to buy a whole lot more than we can. And unfortunately, credit cards have made that possible. And they're great. I use mine a lot. Um, but they're incredibly dangerous as well. Totally agree. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, okay, so we have defined what financial stress is. We've talked about who it is, and we really have decided it happens to people from all walks of life. I think one of the things that I felt when I was very young and didn't have any money for groceries, I was driving a pretty nice vehicle, though I, I'm at fault. I mean, human, it took a long time to learn those lessons. But it's, it's everybody has, a, has the ability, and a lot of us are one bad accident, one bad fall down the stairs, one mm -hmm. hospital visit, one bruised kidney away from having some financial trouble. So I think that it's important for us to realize and for us to educate, and we're gonna talk about that in the next segment, that this can happen to anybody. It isn't about, I don't have an education, Mm -hmm. And so I'm always going to be like this because some of the best educated people in the world have financial stresses. So that's kind of, that kind of wraps up segment two. We are going to be back in a few minutes and we are going to talk about how do we start ending the problem of financial stress. So we will see you in just a couple of minutes. I am Joni and you're watching What's Happening Wapaka. The Wapaka Recreation Center, featuring programming for all ages. Home of the Wapaka Senior Center and youth programming Friday and Saturday nights, featuring two full gyms and space for various sports and activities. Visit the dance exercise studio for a variety of classes. The rec center is a safe place to hang out also featuring a computer lab and classes, and a meeting room and other facilities available for rent. The rec center features different programming and meetings, and is the home of the Parks and Recreation Office. The Wapaka Recreation Center, a great place for all ages and activities. 407 School Street, downtown Wapaka. Welcome back to this episode of What's Happening in Wapaka. My name is Joni. We are talking finances today, and we're talking finances with Jay Kirchner from Farmer State Bank, and we're talking um, with Kate Moody from MS Moody, who Ms. <laughs> Ms. Moody, Mo Ms. Moody um, who does financial counseling mm -hmm. and coaching. So in segment one, we kind of defined what it is to be under financial stress. Lots of us call it broke, but I don't think that's appropriate because I don't think that that's a clear definition, is it? I like the term financially unstable. Okay. Or financial that's... instability, financial insecurity. Okay, you know you're in trouble if one bad thing happens. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
you know, if you look at, if you can honestly answer the question, am I in trouble if, then you're probably financially unstable, okay? That's a good way to do it. Secondly, we talked about who it happens to, and we found out it happens or can happen to absolutely everybody because I don't know anyone mm -hmm. who is immune from ever falling down the stairs and breaking a leg. So we know that that, I mean, we know that those things can happen. So in segment three, we are going to talk about how to fix it. This must be an easy problem to fix. And I know the two of you both do a lot of action as far as education. So we're going to start with the end and we're going to start with adults, Kate, because you work with, you told us, widows, widowers. Specialize with widows, widowers, um, divorcees. And divorcees. So what do you do and how do you do it? Uh, it depends on what their needs are. So everybody has different needs, different situation, different background. Um, but usually it's budgeting getting all the bills together, figuring out what needs to be paid, figuring out exactly how much money you need every month just to cover your needs. Uh, how does that work? And then if people have problems, um, maybe they spend money to feel better, which a lot of people do. I've certainly done it myself. Um, well, why do you need to feel better? What else could you do? So working on those behavioral changes as well and focusing on people's financial goals. Because when you have a goal, you're more willing to sacrifice in order to get to that goal. Uh, so it's, it's fun. I love it. <laughs> Interesting. Mm -hmm. and, and because everybody is different, it, the lesson is a little different to teach for everybody because yeah. they're all in different positions and to there's start with. a lot of education. So what, what actually is a stock? What actually is a bond? What is a mutual fund? 401k, retirement? Uh, 529s, interest, compound interest, these are really confusing things. And people don't want to show that they don't know what these terms mean, so they don't ask, which is just the worst thing they could do, because then they don't learn anything. So I'm there to say, like, no, 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 no judgment here. Lay it on. What do we need to go over? <laughs> You know, and that's one of the things we're taught is don't, don't ask, don't admit you don't know something because you're going to look stupid. And I think the smartest people in the world, at least I'd like to think so, because I'm forever saying, I have no idea what that teach me. <laughs> because I have no idea what you're talking mm -hmm. about, because how else am I going to learn it? Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. So, Jay, you do, besides talking with the people that come into the bank, with the bank clients, you also do some educating in the Wapaka School system. So tell us how you do that in the grades that you affect. Um, we have different programs for every level. We have a K through five program that we started 22 years ago when I started at the bank. Um, and we have a different savings program at uh, every level. Uh, we do talk budgeting in the fourth grade level. Uh, we spend a million dollars as a class. And it's always interesting because we have, I would say, less than 5% in the 22 years we've done it has saved first. After we talked five minutes before that, about saving money for the future, saving for college, saving for the home they want, saving for that house they want. And then the first thing they do is go spend it on that stuff and not buy groceries and not buy clothes and not buy things that they actually need. So we have a program that we kind of talk to them and talk kind of similar to what you're talking mm -hmm. about, needs and wants. Is it absolutely necessary to have that today or is food more important? Is it absolutely necessary to have that that beautiful house, or can you have a downsized house and have some extra money for other things you, you, you're wanting and needing? So we talk about that. Um, we talk foreign currency, current currency, different things like that. We have been in the middle school, and we do go in the high school and talk to them on their financial stuff, too. And, and I think uh, the school system has been excellent here in Wapaka as far as being proactive, tr trying to teach kids about checkbooks and teaching about budgeting like we're talking today. And hopefully over time that will help because I, I do see people struggling with understanding what their expenses are and understanding what that money is and, 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 and always expecting that there, there will be enough money but not knowing for sure. And I think some of it is educating them and, and not being afraid to talk about it. So if you talk about it in a school, everyone's hearing it versus all of a sudden, oh, I, I, I didn't know that, I'm not going to ask that because I agree with you. There's so many people out there that won't ask questions. The ones that do come in and ask us, we're always willing to help. Mm -hmm. um, but 
we don't know if you need that help unless you ask us. So that's a lot of times what we're doing is, is looking at that. So I think the education is the start, but also the people understanding their situation and what they're doing. A lot of times, you know, the people that need extra money are spending it five days a week at, at a um, fast food restaurant instead of doing some things. Um, or always eating out on supper and lunch. So now all of a sudden that cost does drive up. So there are some things that I think you can do, uh, you know, when we're talking that $150,000 person, they're buying coffee at every stop. They're buying all these things that you can make at home a lot cheaper than, than going through the stores and doing some of that. So I think there's always ways if we look at our personal lives, we can mm -hmm. always find some way to cut a little here and a little there that can help us in these situations. So if somebody came to you guys and said, I need to try to figure out how to save. I'm supposed to be putting away $100 a week. And I try, but I end up taking it back out of my savings account. What do you, what do you say? How, how do you fix that? Or how do you teach them how to save when they're hearing that they should be putting away far more money than they have to put away? I'd I first get to know the person because money is 90% emotional and 10% logic for most of us. So if they're, they know that they should be putting that $100 away, but if they keep taking it out, then I think that's where the emotion is coming in. Um, and so if that's not possible, well, maybe you could save up enough money for one week's worth of budget and just keep that in the savings account for a month. Don't touch it for a month. And these little goals, once you start getting them under your belt, you're getting more confident and you realize, oh, I can do this. Um, and then once you're confident about it, you're really able to strive and set higher goals and make yourself challenge. And then you meet those. It's a wonderful snowball effect. It is, actually. Mm -hmm. If somebody came in the bank, Jay, and said, I can't figure out how to save money, and you knew that they didn't have a lot of money to save, what would you tell them? A lot of similar things. One, let's look at what, what you're currently spending your money on and see if there's anything. Are you paying extra fees for, for accounts that you don't need to or, or extra service fees and th things like that? Um, is there other loan opportunities that might be able to consolidate some of that debt that can bring some of that cost down versus having you know, five different loans at high interest rates, 18, 20, 25 percent? Can, can you look at that and, and help them that way? Um, but it, it is a, a major issue, and I think a lot of it is talking about what, what is needs and wants, and also what can you do on a daily basis. Those small goals you're talking mm -hmm. about are huge because they can't sometimes see those small goals. They, they can't see because they're already spent the next dime, the next dime, and we got to get them into more of a, I hate to say this, a cash society where I, I'm going to give you, if I have to spend it, it's coming out of my hand. It, it's a lot harder than than doing the credit card and doing the debit card oh, yeah. and then only looking at it once a month. And I, you know, I, I shared with you guys that when my husband and I were starting out, we were, we, we couldn't afford food. We couldn't afford, we didn't have an apartment. We were living in a semi truck. Um, we literally had no money. Mm -hmm. it took me two years and two weeks to pay off $40,000 in collections, which is something that I'm extremely proud of and yeah. yet very ashamed that I actually got to that point. But we lived on $200 in cash a week. I would go to the bank every Saturday morning. I would withdraw $200 in cash. He got 100 in his wallet, and I put 100 in mine. I never touched mine because he paid for everything. So midweek, he was always broke, and he would ask. And so I would start to, that's what it was there mm -hmm. for. I bought a little round metal trash can. Stands about that. Still have it. And I called it my stash can. So at the, when I went to the bank the next Saturday morning, I came back to the house and I would give him his cash if he gave me any dollars left in his wallet. So if he had one or two or three, I would take that and he would get his, because you couldn't have $203 that week, it was a $200 a week. And I would take that money and I'd put it in my stash can. We went on vacation to North Carolina on that two and three dollars a week we saved. And it really was the difference between saying, do I want this or do I, you did that. 
do I take it off the shelf and I would say, do I want this or do I need it? Mm -hmm. And if I wanted it, it went back on the shelf. And it got us a camping vacation in North Carolina that cost us $1,300 because we went super cheap. But, I mean, we got, to, we got to do those things because I had this little stash cam. That's awesome. That's yeah. fantastic. And it's a matter of putting your money where your values are and recognizing that, yeah, you could have a fancy coffee every week or you could get a trip to North Carolina. <laughs> and think about how much Starbucks costs. I mean, it's what, five bucks? Four bucks? Let's, like let's call it five. It's $25 a week. That's a grand a year. Yeah. And when I look at it, the internet is so impulse buying. You, mm -hmm. you can have everything shipped to you. So, I, so what I try to do is I look at it that day and I put it aside. And if I come back to it, then it might be one of those things you purchase. But a lot of times, the next day, I'm not thinking about it. I'm thinking about something else. And you move on. So try not to get into those you know, impulse buys of something uh, you're walking in a store, that's one of our other training programs we do, walking in a store for second graders. They walk down the first aisle and they buy everything in the first aisle, but they never got to see the whole store. There's a lot of things in that store that you might want. Look at everything and then make decisions versus making that decision right away because that's just human nature. We're, we're very impulse people, and mm -hmm. I think if we can take that impulse away and, and try to look at it more on an objective, if it comes back and I, the next day I want it, and the next day I want it, and the next day I want it, well then what maybe I, I have to give something else up and, and looking at it in that aspect. So I think what you did was phenomenal. That's, I wish more people would take mm -hmm. that approach because that approach would help them. It does, but you're one of the few people I've ever spoken with that agree with me that we would be better off on cash because debit cards are a non-never-ending source of money because you never feel it leave your fist. And you never end up with an empty wallet. Right. And, that, and, and that only having $200 a week for everything and knowing we were going home and had, having to buy $50 a week of groceries, which mm -hmm. was our budget back then. And granted, this is 20 years ago, so things have changed, the prices have gone up a little. Um, but that really, I mean, that really puts a constraint on do I want groceries for next week or do I want to have pizza tonight? Yeah, I will say uh, that is, I call it going on a cash diet. Um, one of the best ways to constrain your spending. Also for the internet with um, impulse buying, if you delete your credit card information from websites so you can't just click, buy with one click. You actually have to get up, go find your wallet, come back. It's amazing how much you suddenly don't need when you need to get off the couch. <laughs> but these Very tiny true. steps that you can take will save you a lot of money. And I liked your idea of put it in the shopping cart and let it sit there. Yeah. yeah. And figure out how badly you need it. I do that with um, eBay sometimes. I'll put it in the shopping cart and just let it sit there and see how much it bothers me. You know, <laughs> and, and we see this all the time. I mean, people not saving for retirement, in my sense, is still uh, you're probably cash poor because the next you get a raise at work, a two percent raise or a three percent raise, let's say, and you spend that two percent more, three percent more, versus what we try to always encourage somebody is each year try to increase that one percent. And if you can increase your, if you if you make two percent more and you take half of that towards retirement, you, you'll get to retire. But so many people we see, they'll spend all of that raise versus looking at that as an opportunity to increase some of their savings for their future. And, and I think that's why when people are you know, working longer and longer, some of it is because we're in a spend, spend, spend mode versus a you know, save first and then worry about the spending after I save that first. And that's, that's hard in, a, in our day and age. But I think, one, you've got to realize it first. That the first step is understanding that process and then understanding what you can do to help yourself out. Mm -hmm. You know, getting up off the couch, I think that would help a lot of people because that's yeah. like, oh, I gotta go do something, I, I might not need it. I, I walk away from it and if I really need it, then that's two or three days later, I'll try to go back. But a lot of times I don't, I, I get onto something else. So I think that's where I think people need to do that same thing. Take small steps every day to, to, to work on this stuff because it's not, 
if there was one antidote or one thing to do to solve this problem, it would be easy. But so many people have so many different variables yeah. to it, like you're yeah. talking about, that I think that makes it the hardest thing, and that's why I think it is not so easy to solve. I think mm -hmm. everyone's got to look at their unique situation and say, okay, how can I do this in my situation? Yeah. Uh, for example, we were talking about saving the five bucks every day if you go to Starbucks. But if you love coffee and that brings you a lot of joy, then just budget for it. I, I don't want to stop people from leading a joyous life. You just have to budget for it give appropriately. Up, give up five dollars of something somewhere else. else. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I, I, um, I agree with that. This was a great conversation. Um, really enjoyed having the two of you on this program. Thank, Thank you, you, Kate. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. Because I think you come at it from two, would you guys come at it from different perspectives than I do? And so I think that it was a great, I hope it was a meaningful conversation for us as well as for um, anybody who watches this show. But thank you for your time. I appreciate it. It's, it's a very passionate topic mm -hmm. um, for me. So we talked about money today. We talked about who has money problems. Absolutely everybody. We talked about how can it happen anyway. I mean, it's really easy to happen um, to anybody. We can all be one lost paycheck away from a lot of trouble. And how do we get out of it? I don't know. My favorite thing to say is you could make seven peanut butter sandwiches for one dollar. <laughs> you know, you could get really sick of peanut butter, but if you're going to eat junk food, peanut butter is the one to do. Mm -hmm. and, you, and if I can have seven sandwiches for a buck, it's a whole lot cheaper than anything else I can do. So it's about taking little steps and it's about communicating. Really like that you talk to kids uh, K through five because I think that's where it starts. Is talk, there's nothing wrong with talking to your kids about being on a budget. And there's nothing wrong with sharing with them that money is tight. It mm -hmm. is just one of those life things. Mm -hmm. so, um, so that was what we were all about today. Again, I thank Kate Moody and Jay Kirchner for joining me on What's Happening Wapaka. I am Joni, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>